Hello, everyone. You are listening to our Future Past, the early music podcast. This series is produced by REMA, the European Early Music Network. I am Yasmina Czernčić, and to record this episode, I have attended the international symposium organized by Cité de la Musique, Philharmonie de Paris, in collaboration with ICOM, the International Council of Museums, more precisely the Comité International pour les Musées et Collections d'Instruments et de Musique, SIMSIM, and the International Committee for Museums and Collections of Science and Technology, SIMUSET. The symposium is called Playing and Operating, Functionality in Museum Objects and Instruments. So today's episode will be about how the priceless ancient instruments of our museum's collections can be or should not be performed on, how the newest technologies can help the curators and various researchers to study them, and finally, how performers work with them, and what is the legacy of these instruments to museum visitors or simply museum lovers. Let's listen first to Thierry Maniguet, the scientific head of the curatorial team of Musée de la Musique. I'm Thierry Maniguet, I'm curator at the Musée de la Musique, and I am the scientific head of the curator, curatorial team. Two kind of people are attending this conference, and that was the purpose from the very start. Professionals coming from museums who are half in charge or who are talking about music, musical instruments, and science museums, science and techniques museums. Why did we organize this conference and why did we did it here? Because for many, many years we are asking ourselves how can we not only show musical instruments but not only talk about music but how can we make the music alive in our museum. How can we deal with this big problem with two opposite issues? The first one being if we play a musical instrument, well, we are going to to use it, to damage it in the end, whatever we can hear. And if we don't play it, how can we give to the public the identity of the instrument? Because a musical instrument is there to be played. It's there to make music with. Should we change some pieces? Should we make copies or not? Exact copies or so? This is a big problem. And the idea was to um, explore all the new tools, all the new technologies, the, the virtual representation of the objects, but also what has to deal with 3D, uh, three-dimension three scanning and virtualization and um, everything with the um, artificial intelligence. Can you give us an example that illustrates this conflict between the will to demonstrate an instrument's sound qualities and the necessity of following the preservation guidelines? Talking about my presentation, it was about a barrel organ, barrel organ from the 1830s. And this instrument won't be able, won't be functional anymore because uh, we have too many changes in it. It has been restored, but badly restored, and we don't really know what was this early state. It's uh, very often it was used for popular music, but not only. And um, it this type of instrument gives access to a music before the recording techniques existed. So you can. It's like this, you know how certain kind of music was played because if you get access to the what is encrypted on this barrel, you get access to the music. So my presentation was um, how I managed to decipher what is encrypted on this barrel without actually playing the instrument. So how can we make sound instrument without playing it? And thanks to the new technologies, we we can. It. 
Now I meet Emanuele Marconi, who is the director of the Museum for Wind Instruments in La Couture Bousset. The small town west of Paris was the heart of a boxwood wind instruments makers community from the 17th century, and the museum was the first makers museum to open in France in 1888. In my experience as curator and director of the Woodwinds Museum, um, which is, by the way, very recent, just one year, what we are striving to do is to change uh, the museum experience of visitors um, in a sense that will be more immersive. I'd like to provide what I, uh, what I call a full sensorial experience, so all, let's say, four senses. There's no way we can describe them with words. And typically when um, you follow a museum visit or a temporary exhibition visit, they will describe you things with words that if you haven't experienced that before, have no sense for you. Let's talk about a violin bow, for example. If they tell you that this violin bow is more flexible than that other violin bow, if you have never touched a violin bow, this information is pointless. Or if they tell you that um, that specific instrument made with this material is heavier than the other one, it's a pointless information. If you can hold this instrument, if you can touch a bow and, and test the flexibility, in a second you'll get the information and you will remember it. So this is relevant for visitors who are also musicians. It enables them to experience what the original, untouchable bow must feel like. Then we have a second level of information that appeals also to a broader audience. I think it's very important because we are dealing with technical objects and they're difficult to understand because if we, if we are not musicians um, it's hard to get the sense of a musical instrument if it's not a painted keyboard that everyone can easily appreciate but if you're looking to um, let's say a modern clarinet it's hard to find um, something to understand if you don't play it it's 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 a, Basically, it's, it's a black pipe with some metal keys on it. But if I can explain you or let you try something, you will immediately get the sense of this object. And that's especially for this kind, for, for the large public that we are trying to this immersive experience. Um, there's no point, for example, of talking about the density of wood and the importance on making different uh, instruments with uh, making the same instrument with different woods. If I let you experience the difference in, in weight between the spruce and the ebony, for example, in a second you will get why the density is so important. So the hands-on experience, the fact of smelling some uh, components of the varnishes, uh, of violins, for example, um, can bring you back to, let's say, other words of knowledge and experience that, if I describe them with words, would be absolutely pointless. Because, just to make a, 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 an example, there are components of violin varnishes that are used for perfumes. And so you will immediately get it because you can recognize it. And if I just tell you the name of the chemical composition, it doesn't say very much. So my point is trying to um, create a, a museum in the future where everyone can enter and have the, a similar experience of a maker, of a musician, of a spectator, because they can hear, they can uh, touch, they can smell the objects as if you were a maker, because that why trying to have this experience because when we are working the materials there are smells that and there are sounds that we do with the, with the tools so that's why i'm advocating for this sort of immersive experience so that we can really understand what not really understand we can better understand what being a maker is or what being a musician is
I think there are two ways to, to listen or to experience art. One is very emotional, one is very rational, based on the knowledge you have. They're both great. Uh, I'd like just to introduce some additional elements in order to have a more informed experience. You don't necessarily need all of them, but these are some small inputs we try to give you to appreciate in a different way, in, a, in an alternative way, um, your uh, musical experience. It becomes clearer how the physical and technical qualities of the museum instruments as objects can support a more immersive and musical understanding for a visitor. We will now hear about two fascinating projects that underline how museum collections can work directly with performers. The first one is the Boussu project, which is actually related to the music that you have been hearing throughout this episode. My name is Geerten Verbergmoes. I'm from, uh, I live in Holland, but I work in Belgium at the School of Art. So I teach uh, workshop classes to how to make the instruments to the students. Uh, and I'm specialized in violin making. Uh, and I also teach some theoretical courses like chemistry and acoustics. At one point I wanted to make a, a Baroque violin and it's quite difficult to find the good examples of that because um, as you know most violins are modified in time so all the famous Stradivari, Guarneri etc they are they are all changed because at some time they had to be louder in, uh, in the 19th century they had to be above the orchestra so they did all kinds of things to them to make them uh, louder and, and more, another timbre. That means also that a lot of those uh, old instruments have been modified. There are not many good examples uh, which if you want to make a true copy of, of a baroque violin you have to look, look really good. And I found one in uh, the Musical Instruments Museum in Brussels and it was by a maker called Benoit Joseph Boussu. There was no information about where, when he was born, where he came from, when he died. And yeah, and that triggered my interest. I tried to find as many instruments by this maker Boussu as possible. I found 50 up to now. Mo well, violins, uh, violas, cellos and double basses, but two. And, and also one plucked instrument, plucked string instrument. We are lucky that there are two instruments of him, a violin and a cello, which are in completely untouched state. So mm -hmm. that means that they are well, they, of course, they, they have aged a bit, but uh, the way they are constructed and, and the construction at, at this time is still the construction as it was in 1750. And that's very unusual because I think maybe in Europe there may be only a few dozen instruments in that, uh, that con uh, state, so, so completely unmodified. And um, yeah, so... These two examples, the violin and the cello, we, we made CT scans of them in cooperation with the Musical Instruments Museum in Brussels, where they, the instruments are, and, and uh, two hospitals in Brussels. So I have to thank them <laughs> to do that, because it's, it's quite unusual that you have the opportunity. But well, And from the CT scans, I could uh, really see the inside and the construction of, of how they were made. And then the next step was to to find out how are they made. So what was the, how, how did this Boussu uh, maker, how did he work? So every maker locally had their own making system. And uh, so this, uh, so Boussu also had that. He worked in a tradition of nor Northern Europe. And that there are some details uh, with a neck going into the body uh, without a mold. But he also has his specific uh, own features of making. And that was, uh, yeah, that was, bit a mix of, of the old tradition and the new tradition. Well, and from all those observations, I, I tried to, to find out how did he work. I started to make uh, a few instruments according to this uh, making hypothesis. And I finished uh, three violins and one cello. And so, uh, and I tried to make them uh, uh, with techniques and also materials as close as possible to the original. <laughs> The next step of, uh, of the project, so I, I then had the, uh, the, the fortune to work with three very good musicians, uh, in uh, Baroque musicians from Belgium. Uh, the names are uh, Anne Knop, a violin player also known from Sigswat Kuiken, uh, Shiho Ono, also in several Baroque ensembles, and a cellist called 
Mathilde Wolfs. We uh, started this ensemble, it was called Ensemble Boussu, uh, appropriately. The instruments of Boussu are a bit, they have a bit uh, thick top plate, so it's not, well, it's maybe a bit of an unusual sound. On the Monday I went to the laboratory of Claudia Fritz, who is, a, who is an acoustic researcher, and we measured uh, my three violin replicas, we did acoustical measurements on them, and we could see certain trends in it, and that material those spectra that we got, we can use in the future to compare to other Baroque violins. And that's made a bit of the plan, to, to see how different are they from others, maybe from modified instruments, maybe from uh, unmodified instruments from the same period, from later or earlier period. Yeah, that's uh, maybe a next stage. They do not allow those instruments to be tuned or played. Yeah, it's a, I think it's a good decision uh, by them, because... Um, well, this, this instrument, this violin, and also the cello that I copied are complete in untouched state. Well, and they have maybe been played a bit in the, in the past, but when we give them now to musicians, they, they are going to turn the packs. They are maybe asking to, uh, the pack is not running, can you make fix it a bit? And then you, you start modifying the instrument and you, you can lose information. Uh, another thing is that those instruments are were in this collection of the museum since more than 100 years, have not been played since then. Uh, and, and the glue, for instance, the, the, the organic glue that's used can, be, can have become brittle. And that means that if we are going to tune them now, and, and strings of a violin have a lot of force, that it's maybe 20 kilos of for, force pulling, it, it could be that the instrument is going to deform or to, to, yeah, to, to maybe to get damaged. So I'm happy that they do not allow uh, playing. As I said, we can never be completely 100% sure that we have made the ultimate sound copy. Yeah, we have to. That, that's always a part. That's that's all a big theme in historical, uh, historically informed performance. Eh? You you cannot be 100% sure. We have. To, yeah, sometimes you have to take that for granted. With the Boussu project, we have a clear example of what a collaboration between a museum, a maker, performers acoustic specialists, and even hospitals can lead to. The last person I met during the symposium was Sebastian Kirsch. My name is Sebastian Kirsch. I'm a conservator and researcher um, for musical instruments, and my studies are basically based on computer tomography and the history of musical instruments. And especially the history of technology of musical instruments. There was a big mass production of lutes in the 16th and 17th century, and after that, lutes, old lutes were always very, very popular. So, like today, everyone wants to play an old instrument. Also at that time, people wanted to play old lutes. So, to um, adapt them to the changing fashion of music, they had to, the instrument builders had to modify them, and um, that means they had to cut their necks and had to modify the ribs on the inside of the soundboard and to apply new wider necks and um, different pack boxes. And so, basically, only the, the back of the lute, the bowl, and the old soundboard was kept. I built a lute by myself in a state like it could have been in 1550 and I start to do all these um, alterations on this instrument and this means I cut the neck, I change the bearing of the soundboard and um, all this and uh, I record everything, I make computer tomography of the different states, I document every, every state by acoustical measurements and also I let the professional lutenist play the instrument. I record every single tone of the instrument which can be used for uh, yeah, for a virtual reconstruction of the instrument so I can someone could play it on the computer and um, yeah such things. The most interesting part you thought the feedback from the, the people who were playing it or your own feedback how did the the, the sound change or, or what could that tell us maybe about certain aesthetic principles of a time or you know connected to historical informed practice yeah which was good to play the french lute music which had a lot of uh, um, 
colorations and a lot of um, not so many chords but more a line of music and later it changed so the music had more was more based on chords and on then people needed a lot of more um, bass function so they added longer strings and deeper strings more strings in the in the ambitus of the bass so the performer can tell me if this instrument works for his purpose and has probably some experience in um, performance and in, in the music so he knows best what the instrument must be able to do or what what it what uh, he expects from an instrument to do we have a very hmm, interesting case in a monastery in austria and krems münster there we have a couple of lutes preserved. At the moment, it's six lutes, which are st still at the at the uh, monastery, and I was able to restore them with a colleague. And we have the situation that there are six instruments, and we know exactly what kind of music was played on these instruments. So we have the actual lute books preserved also in this monastery. So this is extremely valuable to know. Okay, these instruments, they played this music. I'm sure that they have completely different tonal quality. There are a lot of parameters and I made the experience that the museum instruments that can be played, it's not such a big satisfaction to play the old instruments. So what is, what Why? do we expect? Yeah. Why isn't it such a satisfaction to play? Because you have to, yeah, you have to make a lot of compromises. In a museum, I had the feeling that neither the musician is very happy because the conservator always says mm, you cannot tune it as high as you would like or or the uh, the expert is not not uh, happy with the result but i don't want to say that it's um, not nice to play old instruments especially old lutes there are many nice old lutes that sound nice but i prefer a good replica to to the original i have to say we now leave the Philharmonie to meet with two performers who happen to be both keyboard players that have made working with instrument makers and museum collections a part of their life as a performer. I had a talk with the harpsichordist Jean-Luc O, who plays frequently with the facsimiles made for the Philharmonie's Musée de la Musique. My name is Jean-Luc O. I I live in, uh, in Paris and I've been studying for years and years early keyboards, mostly harpsichord. I graduated uh, with harpsichord studies and basso continuo, but I was from a very young age, uh, very interested in other keyboard instruments from the Baroque period uh, as clavichord, organ. Since I started playing the organ uh, when I was 14, something like that, I started to do a lot of visit of historical instruments and I uh, have also big friendship with a uh, harpsichord builder for uh, that I start meeting and working with around uh, 2002 with Emile Jobin. He was uh, in the same uh, countryside of Paris and it was he was not very far from my parents and, and I could be present in uh, many different steps and periods of his work. I can say that I helped him to glue every single soundboard of all his instruments for, for more than 10 years and I was very present at, at uh, his workshop and I learned a lot, a lot, a lot from, from him. I, uh, since I was student in Conservatoire de Paris, I uh, was easily in contact with the instrument and with the curator of the Philharmonie de Paris. It was a big keyboard historical uh, department. I started with buying, doing visit of the historical instrument with the class of course and then since 2006 they hired me as a guide i was also present for recordings of the historical instrument because they have this campaign de son uh, politique of, of recording for of doing recording of all the playable historical uh, instruments so i did some video and some audio recordings of uh, orgue de salon from jean baptiste schweikart which is uh, in the collection from a historical french 18th 17th century regal also 
And uh, as a musician, as a performer, I did a few concerts in, Phil in the programmation of Philharmonie de Paris. Uh, one of it was, uh, part of one of it was a concerto of Carl Philippe Emmanuel Bach that I did in 2008 on the historical instrument uh, after Longman and Broderip. And last thing, I also helped uh, my uh, friend, harpsichord builder, Emile Jobin, for a work of restoration of the, I think it's the 761 or 51 French harpsichord, uh, which was restrung and uh, revoiced. This was done two, two years ago, so I was uh, present to, to help him in the laboratory of uh, La Philharmonie. I think we we have to be very close to historical uh, instrument and with very fine new facsimile and an instrument because we there's a lot of things to to learn from them. Um, can you tell us a little bit what what your part in such collaboration is? So um, why is it important that a luthier, uh, an instrument maker, calls a performer? to help them? How can you as a performer help somebody who builds instruments? The music I play, the, the research about music, notes and, and history, musicology, goes with the interest with historical instrument. There's a lot of things to, to learn about it because it's an alive uh, source of uh, material and it's a real partner for, for research and performing. The historical instrument and the very refined modern instrument have a lot of potential of expressivity and we need to, to live with them or, and to, to be very close to them to understand them very well. That's why I enjoy so much working with Emil Joba and knowing his instrument. We have to to analyze the the beauty of the music on it and and how why it is so touching and so moving and and how it helps the player to to make the best he can. It allows us to to recreate it the, this feeling and this uh, this exigence on a more basic instrument. I'm always proud when after a concert. And, People react and say, oh, we didn't know that this music fits so well on our organ. Or oh, we never heard our harpsichord sound like this. Even if it is a basic instrument, we have to be in contact and to study the very good instrument to, to, to make the basic instrument sound the, the best they, they can. It sounds frustrating somehow to know that you can know so much about a material object and yet so little about how it sounded when it was originally played. It is almost magical and it does teach us something as a performer, as a researcher or even as a museum visitor. Finally, I interviewed the organetto player Catalina Vicenz. She has had the luck of working directly with historical instruments that were mostly untouched and this has been a special experience for her. You have the experience of working with museums, preserving original musical instruments. What instruments are you mostly working with in such situations? I'm mostly working with uh, harpsichords in museums, uh, harpsichords of the 16th and 17th centuries, and then as well uh, on historical pianos and harpsichords also of the 18th century. Um, I also do work with museums that are, for example, organ museums or churches that preserve other types of original instruments, which are often historical organs, Renaissance or late medieval organs. These museums have concert series, or it's for research purposes that I come there, or that I am asked to collaborate in some project, uh, or give a lecture after this research has been done or bringing in some of my other research fields into, into this type of collaboration. Some years ago, you recorded an album playing, uh, if I'm not mistaken, playing the 1525 Italian harpsichord from Naples, which you promoted under the hashtag oldest playable harpsichord. Could you tell us more about this project? Uh, what were the challenges of playing such an old instrument? 
Well, so this was uh, the premier recording of this instrument that had been recently acquired and restored by the National Music Museum in the States, in South Dakota. The instrument was uh, in Argentina, actually, for a long time. I was invited first to give a lecture and a performance at this instrument in 2014. And then it came the idea to record the instrument and to premiere it. The most important thing is, of course, the research work on my side to think what is going to be that I will be proposing to this instrument. <laughs> Uh, but also the communication with the instrument curator, with the museum director in this case, that we were trying to think, of course, what are the best uh, recording conditions. The curator is a specialist knowing most about the history and the technical aspects of this instrument. So communicating the different needs and ideas from both sides was very important uh, to prepare all of this. This harpsichord is in particularly very good state and a very good condition of preservation. It didn't have a severe damage, so the restoration of this instrument didn't involve too much fixing that what was broken or missing or so on. It was mostly bringing it back to the condition in which it was conceived in the 16th century, which is like a miracle. <laughs> But it still, of course, takes uh, lots of adaptation. Technically, one of the things that is interesting for me of working with this antique instruments is the amazing variety that you find. Sometimes those very little differences that you find in the way that in an instrument is built, um, because they are not just copies of one model, as we often have today, that most of the reconstructions are reconstructions of or copies of five harpsichord plans that are circulating mostly and that are more popular. Here, back then, every instrument was followed perhaps certain traditions and patterns, but these builders are always in the search uh, of technical innovation and so on. So that, of course, takes... If, if a key length is different, if the balance point is different, there's lots of aspects that influence uh, technically how you need to adapt to it. Many instruments that cannot be played um, cannot be played either because a museum just decides instruments should not be played and it's a policy. And these are sometimes affected by international policies, by national policies. On the other hand, there's some decisions that are just restricted to research and also internal decision-making that assess that one instrument might be too damaged to make it worth being restored because that would affect so much the original condition of the instrument and would really become a hybrid of a modern instrument with an old instrument. And in other cases, what I see would have a role in this process is where there's museums that are open for having their instruments played and they have a restoration policy that's quite open. But they have, for example, said put priority in some instruments that seem more fashionable or for some reasons they have decided to restore. And some others stay neglected because every restoration project and conservation project is demanding lots of finance and time and so on. So that's where, as a specialist of this field, I can say, eh, look, there's so much music that we could only discover if we had this instrument really working again and or we could have copies of this but is it possible or bringing in this communication this exchange i think can be valuable for uh, for collections as well yes what about all that could be brought to light 
if only we had the time and resources to study more instruments, how they were made, and research how they could be played? And so this episode ends on this note. The quest for original sound, original performance in historical instruments, actually embodies the impossible search for authenticity in early music. Some of it will elude us forever, leaving ground for mystery, but also for artistic creation and creativity. This podcast series is a preparation for the upcoming European Early Music Summit that will take place in Beaux-Arts in November 2020. It will assess the state of early music today and take a critical look at its practices and evolution. The next episodes will give you an overview of the topics that will be debated during this three-day conference. So stay tuned for more insight into the lives and ideas of your favorite performers, to know what your favorite concert halls are up to these days, and get to know in advance what you can expect for the next years of live or recorded music and exciting research projects. See you next Monday for more episodes. <music>